right, if you have a Bible with you, open it to the book of Colossians. We had a two-week break for Easter. Uh, we're in a series on Colossians. It's time to get back into it and get going. Now, you might be new. You might not have been here. So we're just going to take a minute and spin you back up to speed. The book of Colossians, Colossians is written to a church in Colossae, modern-day Turkey, not too far from where all those earthquakes just happened. Uh, what we find in here is that Paul is writing to the church, and Paul is currently incarcerated. He is not free to go and visit with them. He is in prison, and the pastor of this church that he didn't plant came and talked to Paul. And he said, listen, I want to tell you about these Christians in Colossae. This church is growing. And he gave a glowing report about a bunch of stuff and then talked about some things that they were struggling with. And we know that Paul and Timothy together created a letter to go to this church. In chapter 1, he, he, just, he just conveys this deep encouragement and this love. He just tells them how much his heart is affected for them, even though he's never seen them in person and doesn't know, just to hear about their faith and their love for one another and how they were living it out and what God was doing. He's just stoked for them. And he, you know, here you have Paul, the mighty Paul, renowned as he planted churches and, and for what's happened, writing this little church and saying, hey, good job, way to go. It's encouraging them. The letter is going to address two concerns he has for them, and they arise out of this. They come from two different backgrounds. Ever met people from different backgrounds? Who's from the East here? Yeah, don't put your hand up. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> You meet people from different backgrounds, they have different accents, they have different customs, they have different... I'm amazed when I get the privilege to travel and we, we meet people whose total experience is different than ours and they're raised in a completely different culture. And so because the Roman world had, was conquering everything and they would take people captive and they would move them around, you have the Greek or polytheistic uh, groups that were all in that area. And, and they, would, they would just not even compute with this worship one God thing. I mean, there was a temple for harvest and a temple for fertility, and there's a God of this and a God of that. And anything that went wrong, you wanted to appease the spirits and make these different sacrifices. But the idea of one true God was just outside of their realm. And so they brought all of that background and all of that thinking and all of that ideology in as they discovered Christ. And it was difficult then to just go, hey, this, this is something new. This is something different. This is Christ alone. You sure we can't add some of this other stuff? And then you had the faithful Jewish, Jews, the, the, the chosen ones, right? And, and they were raised under the law and they had all these prophecies and promises about them. And, and they became Christians when they realized who Jesus was. And, and they said, this is what God's plan was all along. But they, they had all the festivals and all the laws and all the, and they had all these things that you had to do. And so they were struggling with, well, if God's the same yesterday, today, and forever, and this new thing that's happening, don't I still need to keep all of these laws? And, and, and shouldn't we be teaching these people who don't know any better how to observe our laws and how to abstain from this and not do this and do that? And you've got this chaos coming into the church where they truly love each other and they truly have been, become one person. They, they recognize who Jesus is. And Paul wants to establish something, that it's Christ alone. Now, we've been a few weeks into this, and we're all the way to chapter 2. We're going to read verses uh, 5 through 15, 6 through 15 today. And so read along with me or read it on your device. Uh, let's pick it up as Paul's been talking to them. Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you've been filled in him, who is the head of all rule and authority. 
In him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. By putting off the body of flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you, who were dead in your trespass and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Now, every time I see a therefore in scripture, I always stop and go back and go, uh, he's made a point. And Paul has, in chapter one and and into chapter two, is setting the foundation for the things he needs to address in chapter three. And if you want to have some fun, just read the book of Colossians at least once a week while we're going through this and read it as a letter. Don't, Don't separate it out, like read it as one thing that he writes. It only takes a few minutes. And uh, if you go back to the therefore, back in verse two or three, this is three weeks ago, I'm just going to remind you, he said this, this is his goal for them. This is his desire for them, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I mean, he wants the absolute best for these guys. And so let's unpack a little bit about what he has to say, and then we'll get to my favorite question, and uh, we'll praise a little more, and we'll go home. First, he says, you need to center your life here. Now, it's interesting that uh, we need to know some of our core values, don't we? Like, what are we centered on? What's really important to us? When push comes to shove and we have to make decisions and we have to make choices and it affects how we live, we need to know. And so Paul starts with with the very obvious. He goes, okay, first and foremost, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord. So he's excluding a whole bunch of people right there. This letter is to the church. It's to those who come out of those different backgrounds, those who understand. And so he says, as you have personally made this decision and personally responded to the invitation of God and received Christ the Lord, now there's some things we need to do. One of the things that frustrates me most is we look sometimes at salvation like a check mark in the box and then go, we're good, right? I prayed the prayer, I'm in. Well, the Bible doesn't really support that. It talks about responding to what God does. And it talks about inviting men, but then it talks about the whole journey. And he turns and he says, now walk in him. Now walking is an ongoing action, right? It's not take one step. It's not take a baby step. It's not move an inch or two in this direction. In in a sense, it reminds me of the Deuteronomy passage where it says, as you're doing life, put all of these reminders about who God is around you, right? Put them on the door frames of your house, as you go in, as you go out, as you talk to your children, as you go to bed. He's kind of saying, as you're going through life, as you're walking, walk in him. It's a constant theme of Paul's. If you were to read some of his other letters, or even in this letter, in chapter 1, verse 10, in chapter 3, verse 7, in chapter 4, verse 5, in Ephesians 2, 2, 10, 4, 1, and 17, 5, 2, 8, and 15, you would find this idea, John talks about it, others talk about it, this walk as Jesus walked, this doing life. So as you've received him, now walk. Your life has to be centered around this. It's not like on Sunday put aside some time. And on, he's like, this has to affect everything. And then he uses the term rooted. Now, this is an agricultural term if you look it up in the Greek. And uh, I heard a podcaster talking about a book on forests and trees. And he was talking about how when a forest is really healthy and works well, the larger trees are pretty high and they take all the sunlight and then a sapling will start to grow up. 
And because it only gets some sunlight, it usually restricts its growth for a time. And that most of the energy of that young sapling is put into formation or foundation. It's put into a root system. And that when the older trees get old enough and die or something happens eventually, it's then that it starts to put on the canopy and it goes up into the sun and it it becomes productive and fruitful. But there's a time of formation and the roots forming. If you take that idea and you go, what does it look like for me to walk in Jesus but to be rooted, to, to take the time and the investment to go to where the nourishment is, to get a good feeding system into my life, to get a good spiritual foundation. And note that as the Bible talks about us being plants in God's garden or the vine, you know, being grafted into the vine, reproduction and fruit are central to that conversation. He says, be rooted and then built up. Now, the built up is an architectural term. Um, Anybody started out to build something without any plans or design of what it's going to look like? I've tried that before. didn't turn out that well. Uh, You needed a rough idea of what you were doing. I like this architectural term because it talks about being built up or building to a design. And it talks about being taught. And and Chris and I were talking about this, and it's not just being taught how to pound a nail or drive a screw or, or how to do the little tasks, although that's part of it you would learn from building alongside others. But part of the teaching and part of the preaching and part of it is to continually cast the vision that this is the, 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 this is the grand design. This is what we're trying to make. This is where life is going. This is what the overall looks like. It's not just giving tools or it's not just saying, well, we could do it this way or do this thing repetitively. Why? Why would we do that repetitively? Because it gets us to what we're trying to build. It says, walk in him, rooted, built up, know what the design is, build to the design, established. It speaks of something that's flu- not fluid or changing in the circumstances. It's something that's, that's solid, built on a good foundation, not being uprooted or shifting. And then he says, abounding in thanksgiving. The image is the root of that Greek word is this. It's like a river that overflows its banks. Ever seen that? We used to live on this acreage and Prairie Creek came by and there's a little bridge that came over Prairie Creek and and when there was runoff or a huge kind of flood type thing, we actually could get trapped over there. It was kind of fun. But as it overflows its banks and it cuts the channel deeper, that's the image it's used with our thanksgiving that we continually have our focus, our lives are centered on who God is and what he's done. And as we keep looking for what he's doing in us and through us and around us and what he has done, as we keep celebrating that, as we keep being thankful for that, it changes our whole perspective and it overflows the banks of our life and affects others. And Paul starts says, if this is my goal for you, if this is what I'm dreaming of for you, that you would uncover all these riches and treasures Here's the thing. You've got to have your life centered. You've got to know that this is what I'm living for. This is what I'm living about. That I've received Christ. That that I'm going to walk in him. That I want to be rooted. I want to have that nourishment and that system. That spiritual formation built up. I know what I'm shooting for and I'm working towards it. And I'm being reminded all the time, this is why we're doing it. Established, it's not shifting with the circumstances of my life or my society or the times. And abounding every day in thanksgiving. And then just like any good dad, anybody that really cares, he warns them. He says, and hey, watch out. It's the heart of someone who cares deeply. He says, watch out you don't get taken captive. Now, this is a military term. And in this part of the world, they're pretty familiar with Rome taking captive (laughs) other places and spreading them around. And it carries this terminology or this idea, this image that when you're taken captive, you're enslaved, or there's a loss of freedom and ability to make your own choices. 
So he goes, take care, because what could happen out there is you can be taken captive, okay? As you try and center your life on this, here's some ditches that you have to watch out for. He starts with philosophy and empty defeat. Now, I, I, want, I want to tell you this. Philosophy, one of the commentators said it's to love wisdom. It's not a bad thing. Philosophy in and of itself isn't bad. But, but Paul's contrasting two things. He's contrasting human wisdom and philosophy and God's. We should have a philosophy where God's truth is supreme and it reigns. And he says, when it comes apart from life in Jesus, when, when you get wisdom or philosophy about how it should be or how you should live, live or what should happen, he goes, you can be taken captive by that. And again, as it's reading as a letter, uh, we talked about a couple weeks ago, verse four, he said this, I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. There's things that you instinctively know that can't be true. That, that, seems, that doesn't ring right. People say the way to happiness is this, or what you have to do is throw this truth out and, and pursue this. God doesn't really want what's best for you. What do you mean? And there's all kinds of plausible arguments out there. There's all kinds of empty human wisdom and philosophy. And he says, okay, look out. This can take you captive. You can fall prey to this. You can be deceived and deluded by this. Keep your life centered on Christ, but be careful. Let no one take you captive with empty philosophy and deceit. And then he adds human traditions. I like traditions. They're great at reminding us of things, setting apart time. Mother's Day's coming up. Great tradition. See, I'm giving you, you guys a heads up. And then ladies, Father's Day's coming. I know. It's been a bit second rate. You guys could elevate it. We'd be okay with that. I uh, was reading an article about, and I don't know anything about these two guys, but it was two comedians, and they were good friends, and their careers got very successful. And it's kind of, uh, they, kind of a, an agreement between the two of them they decided that they would begin to give each other more and more extravagant gifts for, for their birthdays. That they would just go a little bit further and a little bit further and a little bit, try and outdo each other every year. And uh, I read an, an interview with the one guy who said, we've, we've agreed to quit this nonsense. And he said, we, we came to the realization that it was incredibly stressful. He goes, more than what I would buy my wife or buy anybody else, I worried and I fussed and I spent emotional energy and I, I agonized and I, it took over my life. The tradition lost its meaning. I do lots of weddings and I watch brides who have, uh, I shouldn't just pick on brides. I watch couples. Is that better? Yeah, I'm not going to get in trouble. I'm still getting a frown, so I would better be careful. And they've dreamed all, all their lives about what this day would look like and what's important to them and what they're going to have on the day. I've gone to weddings where there's been unlimited budgets and they've spent incredible amounts of money and the ceremony was absolutely beautiful and the couple didn't make it a year. And it became about the ceremony, not about the marriage. Paul's saying, hey, you know what? There's plausible sounding arguments. There's human philosophy and, de and deceit. Like you, you're going to start thinking we're, we're so much smarter than God. We can figure this out. And it's going to sound pretty good to you. And it's going to give you what you want via a shortcut. He goes, be careful because that will enslave you. That will take you away from your life being centered where it needs to be. But so will human traditions if they become the point. The tradition isn't the point. It's what it's reminding us of. It's what we're celebrating about Christ. Methodologies can change. And then he talks about elemental spirits. Um, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to skip the C.S. Lewis. If you want to see what C.S. Lewis has to say about giving demons too much credit or too little credit, you can go look it up. It's wonderful. But he says there's a spirituality out there 
that's attractive to us because we are invited to try and control things or see into things or understand things apart from Christ. I mean, we see it all over today, right? From astrology to different things. You're invited to dabble, to try. Oh, this isn't so bad. Oh. And he says, that will enslave you. That will take you captive. It's not something to play with. He says, this is all this stuff that I'm warning about is stuff that comes out of the world. It's not of Christ. And you came out of the world and now you're in Christ. There will always be a temptation to surrender our desires, not, or to not surrender our desires to God's way. And to find a way to meet what we would legitimize as a need, want, or desire apart from what God dictated and not trust him for it. And so his warning is, as you center your life on Christ, beware of those desires. They're going to come from fine-sounding arguments and philosophy and wisdom. And they'll come from making the tradition the idol, not Christ, where he should be. Or, and anything that's not of that. And then he reminds them of the truth of where they stand. Now, I love this because he basically goes back and says, now remember who you belong to and who you are. He says, you were condemned. The Bible tells us that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You were dead in your trespasses. You are unable in and of yourself to please a holy God or pay for your own trespass and sin. Now, I know that it's not a popular thought today. To say, like, nobody's perfect. Uh, but you're not. I met most of you. I'm, even this morning, uh, we're not perfect. And if God's standard is holiness, God is holy, and mankind sinned, and the wages or punishment of that sin was separation from God, he's saying, that's where you stood. You stood that one day you would stand before God, and he would say, guilty and you would say yeah i am and that a holy just god would give you the punishment that was established for that sin that was eternal separation from god you know the bible just lays it out and he says you were condemned you were dead in your trespasses you were unable to have a relationship with god that was just where it was at it's not debatable. That's the way it is. And then he says, but God gave new life. He said, God did something on your behalf. He set apart for himself a people, and through that people provided the Lamb of God. Jesus came, fully God, fully man. He lived a sinless life. He went to the cross to pay for your sin. And he said, the ability for us to have the presence of God in us only, become, only comes to us through what God did for us. Paul goes on to say, he forgave us our trespasses. I love this idea that Paul lines it all out. And he goes, uh, so God took action. This, this is where you were. This is what God did. He took action. You've received him. He's made you new. He's given you a heart of flesh. He's now able to have a relationship with you because the sin problem's been taken care of. But don't forget, you don't just have this with shame coming into the presence of God. Uh, you're fully forgiven. Ever had a problem with somebody? You sinned against them? Had to clean it up? Ever been in that place where when you saw them, the shame just came back? Can't believe I failed them like that. Ever been privileged to have that restored? There's no longer any shame. Removed as far as the east is from the west. The Father's love made present. He says he's forgiven your trespasses. More than that, he's canceled the record of debt. And Paul includes in here, he met the legal demands. He fulfilled the law, all of it. 
on both sides of the ditch you're coming out of, know that you've been redeemed, that there's been a restitution made, that your debt is marked paid in full. Jesus took your sins and nailed them to a cross. Do you know what that says to me? Goodbye condemnation. Ever have somebody come to you and go, hey, look what you did? You feel condemned? I don't really have time for this, but when I was going through this, I was thinking about the fear it used to put in me when someone would say, that's going on your permanent record. <laughs> Who's read anybody's permanent record? Seriously. Why, why did that scare me? I don't know. But to know that that's been taken out of your permanent record, removed as far as east is from the west, that if Satan ever came along and poked you and said, hey, look what you did, or somebody brought it up, you just point to the cross and say, yep, <laughs> she dealt with, it's gone. Forgiven, no more condemnation. And then it says he disarmed rulers and authorities, triumphing over them. Quickly, I want you to know that as God's chosen, you're under his banner, you're protected. I don't know how best to illustrate this other than to say um, our family name gives us a free pass in so many places. When you're under Jesus' banner, when God's your father, when the power of sin and death is broken, you don't have to walk around fearing accusation because the enemy is the accuser the accuser, fearing attack all the time. You can put on the armor of God. You can walk into the battle. This has been finished. It's over. We live as God's chosen. We're protected by him. We're under his banner. And we're no longer under that influence. Well, I'm taking too much time today. So that's the big question. Yeah, so what? I mean, we will walk through... Uh, Colossians, and we're going to do it verse by verse. We're not skipping anything. And we'll give you some good information. You'll understand what he's addressing and why he's talking to them. But you're going to leave here to the same world you walked in out of. And so what are some questions you can ask yourselves? What are some things God might want to do in you? What's, what's, how, do you how do you respond to this? Well, the first is you need to identify in your life what you're keeping central. What is it? What's that value where everything's coming out of? You know, first question is, have you received Christ personally? The Bible says if you confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive you your sin, cleanse you from all unrighteousness. If you've understood, if God's opened your eyes, if you've heard the truth about this, and you said, I'm going to surrender my life, I want God to be on the throne. I want that payment applied to my account. It says you can believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, you will be saved. That's where it starts. If you have done that, uh, the next question to, walk you, to ask yourself is, does this walk that I'm walking as I'm going about and I'm doing r reflect this work of his in my life? Is he central? And all of us are honest and go, uh, sometimes, mostly, kind of, maybe. This is uncomfortable. Are you almost done? So I'll move one step further. Are you intentionally organizing your life around putting some roots down? Or are you just ignoring it? Are you studying the word of God? Are you going down deep and letting spiritual formation happen in your life? Do you have your Bible open? Are you seeing the design, the plan for family, for marriage, for life, for you? As you're being transformed into the image of Christ, are you holding that up and going, well, this is the blueprint and design. I'm going to surround myself with people who are getting me towards that. Would you say that you're established? I would have said so before COVID myself. Circumstances certainly pushed me around a little bit. Recognizing that when, when my world doesn't look like I expected it to look, when I don't like what's happening... I'd go back and question some things. No, no, I'm established. But it, that's only a question you can answer. 
And I have to ask this question. I don't, well, I'm going to take time. I don't care. Um, you're here now. You can leave if you have to. And Jen's got the kids, so it's all good. Yeah. If the people that are teaching and instructing you are pointing you to deeper outrage, angst, condemnation, if guilt and shame are the outcome, I would question some of what you're allowing to teach you. If they're lifting the design of Christ, if they're renewing your love for him, if they're stoking your affection for him, if they're giving you tools and encouragement that would root you and establish you and, and move you along, if you're leaving that with a greater hope and trust and peace, it seems like that reflects God in the life of the believer, no? I'm so worried about living life on 10 and the outrage culture and what's happening. And I'm worried that we're allowing people in a pursuit of having a voice in our lives or in our, in our learning, that we're allowing them to stir us to anger and to deep, and then not stir us to greater hope in God, greater trust in God, greater prayer in our lives, greater... It's a question to ask. And my last question would be this, uh, in this section, how does it go on with your abounding in thanksgiving? And, uh, and so if, if I was just a part of your conversations this week, would there be an attitude of gratitude that's spilling out into the lives of those around you? Or are we pretty good at complaining, whining, and lamenting without hope? Second group of questions I would want to ask as you leave, do you know the ditches that you have to watch out for? Questions to ask God, have I been taken by human arguments and ideas? Is there some ways that I've started to go down that road? There's so many ways that I can justify what I want or what I'm trying to build or what I'm trying to do. The question I really have to ask is, have I surrendered that to Jesus? Have I agreed with him that his way will be best? And then Lord, show me if there's any traditions that I've elevated to a wrong place above Jesus in my life and my walk. Finally, that's heavy, so let's encourage you. You want to go out of here and do something incredibly positive and life-changing today? Dwell on what he's done and who you are. Go back and read that. It's incredible. You are chosen by the almighty God to have a relationship with him. It says in the, you know, the idea of circumcision was a mark that identified, set apart for God. It says he, everyone who's, who's had that new life in them is marked by God himself. You're his. It says that his spirit lives within you, that you're alive and redeemed, and that you've been reconciled with God, that you can go to him, that he's the God of all comfort, that he cares, that he says, this is the way, walk in it that you've been set free. If you're living, trying to make right or trying to make atonement for, or pull yourself up with your bootstraps, just confess your sin. He's faithful and just to forgive you sin. He cleanse you from all unrighteousness. You are fully accepted. You don't have to do a thing. He's going to meet you right where you are, right in this circumstance. And that you are a child of the kingdom. If fear is driving your life, it's not God's desire for you. For he is conquered, he is victorious. Let me pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. It's true. Now take away everything that's Bob. But what's from you and what you're trying to do in and through this in our hearts, Lord, we invite that. And so as we stand now and we uh, respond to the living word with our praise, would it be pleasing to you? And would you hear the cries of your people today? In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.